My name is Manuel Egele. I'll be talking about blanket execution, an approach to dynamic similarity testing for program binaries and components. And this is work that I conducted while I was at Carnegie Mellon with my colleagues Maverick Wu, Peter Chapman, and David Brumley. So since we're in the forensic session, it shouldn't be a big task for you to picture yourself as an analyst. May it be a forensics analyst or somebody looking into firmware components, as we heard yesterday, or even a malware analyst. Now, during the, during the course of work of an analyst of your choice, you might be faced with a situation that you just identified a function of interest. And you're like, hmm, this is interesting. What can I do with the function, or what are the questions that are really interesting about the function that I just identified? You might be wondering, have I seen this or something similar before? And if I did, uh, how can I retrieve binaries from a cache that have, function, that have functions that are similar in behavior to what I'm just looking at? And just to give you a little more of an intuition, let's look at a simple example from the LS utility in GNU Core Utils. Now with LS, you obviously can get a directory listing, and you can also tell it to sort the directory entries according to the file or, file or object names. And the sorting, or the comparison for the sort function, is implemented by the strcmp name function that we can see here in line one, two, three. And basically what this function does, it calls another function, namely cmp name, and tells that function that, hey, uh, to compare individual values, please use the string compare function from libc. Furthermore, it passes in two structures of type file info that we'll see a little later on uh, that basically correspond to two elements in the file system that should be compared. The cmp name function in turn then calls uh, the function pointer, the cmp function, which in this calling context is always the string compare function of libc, and passes on as the argument the first element, the name element of the file info struct, then ought to be compared. Now, uh, obviously what we would expect is that if you compare this source, let's say we compare it twice with different optimization settings, uh, if you're looking for similar functionality, our system would best be outputting the two resulting binary snippets as being similar because they come from the same source code, they better be considered similar. However, when I say similar, I strictly do not mean equivalent because if you look at what GCC uh, generates, for example, with the dash O optimization setting, we can clearly see uh, here that we still have the, uh, the two individual functions preserved. So there's a string compare name and the, the CMP name. And then the call to the function pointer in the RAX example down here uh, happens as well. And so we still have all the features that we've observed in the source code, or most of the features at least. And if you compile the exact same source code again with GCC optimization level 03, we see this is starkly different. For example, uh, inlining took place, so instead of having two individual functions, uh, we only have one function left. Furthermore, there is constant propagation in the sense that uh, the compiler determined that in the calling context of SDRCMP name, uh, there is only one function pointer value ever being used, namely the string compare function in libc, therefore this value got in line right away. Furthermore, there is no register spilling going on to the stack to set up stack, stack frames and so on and so forth. Meaning, if we were to evaluate strict equivalence, those two snippets of code are not equivalent. For example, if you consider their stack behavior, running the left example on a full stack will immediately terminate execution because uh, pushing another value onto the stack uh, will fail, whereas the right-hand side will at least continue to run into the strcmp function. So we're not looking for strict equivalence, but rather for similarity of uh, individual fu uh, function binaries. And what this example should show is that the static differences that we see complicate, uh, the syntactic differences that we see complicate the static similarity analyses that are currently state of the art quite a bit. And so the questions that might arise uh, when looking at uh, examples like this is, well, why would that be relevant in a security setting? Well, for example, uh, analyzing patches or performing patch-based exploit generation comes exactly with a, with a question like this. Which functions have been patched or have not been patched in two different versions of a binary? Similarly, when we're talking about malware analysis, well, if there is uh, expensive manual analysis that has to be done as an analyst, well, maybe I can just save myself time if I can identify similar functionality that I've already seen before. And furthermore, uh, that we'll see a little later on in the talk, if we have a component that can identify similar functions, we can do nice uh, higher level things like uh, implement the function binary search engine um, based on this primitive. So as we illustrated with the example, uh, static systems are easily th thrown off uh, by the syntactic differences that different compilers or compiler settings output 
And therefore, our contribution is the proposal of the technique of blanket execution, which tackles the problem of uh, function binary similarity identification from a dynamic analysis point of view. And what blanket execution does at its core is it's executing a function f under a fixed and reproducible execution environment, and it records the side effects or the fe as features that happen during the execution of the function f itself. Uh, we then say that two functions f and g are similar if the side effects, their feature vectors, are similar too. And I will talk about uh, how we define the similarity in a little bit. Now, this slide is only half filled because, of course, you're asking yourself, while well, you're doing dynamic analysis, you're missing a whole lot of code if you're running things just like that. Uh, this is known as a limited coverage problem. And, of course, we had to address the limited coverage uh, in our system. Basically, what we do is, to overcome the limit, limited coverage problem is, we execute the function f repeatedly, starting from the first unexecuted instruction of the function itself. Which means that at the end of blanket execution, we will have full line coverage or instruction coverage of the given function. Now, why this is nice and uh, a big boost for our system, it also means that we have to sacrifice the natural meaning of function execution because we are no longer executing e the function every time from the beginning of the function itself. I've been talking about the execution environment on the previous slide. Um, the execution environment is necessary to provide concrete and consistent values for all the registers that are being used during the dynamic execution and all memory locations that are being accessed. And furthermore, in our system, it is important that the execution environment is efficiently reproducible. And with this in hand, we can define what a blanket execution run actually consists. Uh, from a high level, it consists of three steps. The first step is to load the target binary via the operating system loader. Now, the loader makes sure that all the sections that are mentioned in the binary format are mapped correctly into memory and that uh, we can at least execute code in the executable um, from memory there. Uh, furthermore, uh, the system will then initialize the execution environment. And finally, when the operating system loader uh, transfers control to the application or the program entry point, blanket execution will jump in and take control and divert it to the first unexecuted instruction of f. And by repeatedly executing f from the first unexecuted instruction, we can get uh, this whole coverage uh, of the function itself, which gave name to our technique, therefore thus the blanket execution term. So, however, if you're looking at functions that are compiled and generated by a compiler, uh, they often exist in a bigger framework, namely the program or the application itself, and fu those functions that are being generated oftentimes have dependencies. These dependencies can be, and often are, on global variables, on the structure of past arguments, and so on and so forth. So, however, in blanket execution, functions are executed in a randomized but fixed environment, which means that all these dependencies, or most of those dependencies, are very likely not met. So, uh, the problem then arises that uh, should a function try to access, for example, memory uh, that is not mapped, uh, the, the execution would uh, abort, and we would no longer be able to, coll uh, to collect um, semantic information for, for our feature vectors. And therefore, we have to counteract for that. As a little example to motivate the problem, let's look at the argument access of the compare name function that we've seen a little earlier in the slides. Um, as we can see in line 11, uh, there is a call to the compare function pointer in this case. Uh, using two arguments, namely the A name and B name, uh, both of those values are of type file info. Now, if you look at the definition of file info in the source, we see that the first entry of file info is a character array that specifies the name. So clearly, the compiler will end up um, generating the code, at least an optimizing compiler, which generate the code in the last line that you can see here, that the register RSI is the reference and its value is stored again in the register RSI. Um, now, if you're executing the function itself under a randomized environment, meaning we assign a random value to the register file at the beginning of execution, RSI will most likely point to some memory address that is not being mapped. Clearly a situation we, want, we do not want to end up in. So how can we counteract there? Well, our execution environment also specifies a dummy memory page. And this dummy memory page is mapped on demand at all mapped addresses, which brings along two significant benefits. First, all memory writes that occur will succeed because all of a sudden uh, we have valid memory mapped wherever you want to write. Uh, furthermore, memory reads succeed, and more importantly, they don't only succeed, they're also consistent. 
If you're calculating, for example, uh, addresses based on, or if a function calculates addresses uh, based on input variables or arguments, uh, all the arithmetic uh, transformations that happen uh, will result in the same address again, and therefore consistent values will be read. And it is this consistency in values that allow us to do comparison between individual feature vectors of uh, two different functions. Um, as I said, during execution, we collect the side effects and store them as feature vectors. And just to be a little bit more precise, um, we use dynamically observable features such as memory accesses or system calls that occur during, uh, during execution. And we combine the side effects that we collect per function into a feature vector of length n, n being the number of fe different features that we collect. The individual coordinates of the feature vector are simply sets of the observed feature values. And then we can go on and define the similarity between f and g by this formula that's on the slide here that can be summed up with three simple words. We have a normalized weighted sum of Chicard indices between the individual sets that make up the component of the individual feature vectors. Now with this in mind, let's look at the features that our current prototype implementation uh, considers. We have in total seven features. We consider memory reads and memory writes to the stack area of the program, as well as memory reads and memory writes to the heap area of the program. Furthermore, we look at system calls and library calls via the PLT of the executable. And we also record the function return value in the RAX register should the function run to termination. Now, obviously different, feature, different features might bear different weight in terms of assessing similarity. That's why we have the weighted sum of the Jacquard indices. And to determine the weights, we actually use the Vika machine learning toolkit uh, and the, its SMO implementation to determine optimal weights for our data set. Speaking of data set, how did we come up with a, with a data set that we can use uh, to evaluate whether our uh, uh, blanket execution technique uh, is actually successful in identifying function binary similarity? Well, we took the popular core utils uh, suite of, of programs consisting of 95 binaries, and we used three different compilers uh, to generate a multitude of versions. We used GNU's GCC, Intel's ICC, and LLVM CLang in the corresponding versions you can see up there. And furthermore, for each of the compiler suites that we were using, we, co we compiled four different versions of the entire uh, core utils tools uh, suite uh, with the optimization levels 0 all the way up through 03, which results which resulted uh, in 1140, binary, 1140 binaries and roughly 200,000 functions. Furthermore, we compiled all the, uh, the suites with debug symbols, which gave us access to ground truth because then we could just match uh, function names and declare success if uh, two functions got matched together that actually have the same name. Obviously, for all further purposes uh, of our analysis, we then stripped the binaries and did not rely on the debug symbols. We implemented our blanket execution technique in a, in a tool called Blex. Uh, Blex relies on Intel's PIN uh, dynamic instrumentation environment. And we analyzed uh, the 200,000 functions that we generated in 11 different execution environments. With roughly 1.6 BU runs necessary to cover uh, all the instructions uh, per environment, we ended up running over 17 million BU runs, which resulted in something around 70, uh, 57 CPU days. Now, obviously, this is a big investment in terms of computation resources, but if you're only uh, considering comparing two different versions of, let's say, DLS binary, which is one of the bigger binaries in the core util suite, you can do that in 30 CPU minutes. Now, even this might sound a little much, but the individual BE runs, the blanket execution runs, are entirely independent executions, and therefore, this resembles an embarrassingly parallel workload, which can be scaled up very, very easily. Um, obviously, we wanted to compare our results against uh, systems that are already there, out there. And uh, from an industry's point of, uh, point of view, the standard there is uh, Synamics BINDIF. Um, and we used as a proxy for similarity or dissimilarity the number of optimizations that are being turned on between different optimization levels in the compiler. For example, if you're running GCC with O2 uh, versus the O3 optimization setting, there is only nine additional uh, optimizations being turned on. However, if you compare, uh, if you want to generate larger or samples that differ more, uh, optimization settings O0 versus O3 introduce uh, a, a grand total of 66 optimizations. So we would expect that uh, samples compiled at the second configuration are more different from each other than samples compiled at the first optimization. And as I stated in the beginning, this is the comparison of uh, GCC 
of Coriotils compiled as GCC with O2 and O3, so very similar samples. And as you can see, the gray bars are uh, Bindif and the black bars are blacks. So Bindif consistently, almost consistently at least, slightly outperforms blacks in this uh, scenario. This is because the syntactic similarities are very small since there is only nine differences in individual optimization settings. However, if we turn our focus on uh, large on samples that have uh, larger syntactic differences, for example, the same suite compiled with GCC 0 versus GCC 3 we end up in a situation where Bindiv consistently outperforms, bla uh, where Blacks consistently outperforms Bindiv on average with, by a factor of two. And in certain situations, especially if you're talking about uh, the larger binaries, we get um, an up of uh, a factor of over 3.5 over Bindiv. As promised in the very beginning of the talk and coming somewhat to the end of it right now, uh, based on the primitive that we can identify similar fu function binaries, can't we go out there and build a binary search engine on top of that? Well, let's formalize the problem a little bit. Given an indexed corpus of function binaries and their corresponding feature vectors, f, uh, v1 to vn, and the search query function f. Basically what we want to do is uh, sort the individual feature vectors in C uh, with similarity to f, so to rank the individual functions in decreasing similarity to f, just like a regular search engine would do. Well, how did we stage our experiment? We came up with a thousand randomly selected functions as the queries uh, from the corpus of Coriotil functions compiled with GCC-0. The corpus itself, the index search corpus that we used, were all remaining binaries and the corresponding functions uh, from uh, compiling the Coriotils with GCC with dash 01, 02, and 03. So our search corpus contains roughly 30,000 uh, individual functions and executing a single search um, took less than one second on average. Now let's look a little bit at the results that we got from uh, the search engine um, that, that we implemented here. And we can see that in 64% of all the cases, the correct match, so the closest function, or the function with the same name in the search corpus was actually ranked at the top of the search engine listings. That's not too bad. Uh, furthermore, uh, if you look at, like, if you're comparing it to Google, where most people look at the first page of, of search results, first page commonly contains uh, 10, 10 entries, uh, we can match 77% of the correct functions among the first 10 entries, so basically among the first page of search results. Uh, at the bottom here, you can see the, the CDF uh, that I had to cut off because of the long tail at, at 100, and uh, so basically we can see that uh, roughly 80% we can get on the first two pages. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot get all of them at very good uh, positions in the search results. Which brings me to the summary of my talk. I hope I could convince you that function binary similarity is a challenge and a challenge we're solving. And as we've seen, current state-of-the-art static analysis uh, approaches, as sophisticated as they are, are pretty easily thwarted by syntactic differences that are introduced by benign transformations, by just simply switching out compiler suites or optimization levels. So nothing malicious even going on there, but if you cannot solve the non-malicious case, well, uh, what hope do we have to solve the malicious case then if somebody is actually going after us to try to evade us as we heard earlier in DeLong's talk? Uh, to solve this problem or to tackle this problem, we propose blanket execution, uh, dynamic analysis to identify similar function binaries. And in blanket execution, our core idea is that we can achieve coverage by re-executing the function at, uh, under analysis from instructions that have not been covered so far. Uh, with this in mind, we can generate feature vectors as the values being observed, as the dynamic values being observed during execution, and declare two functions as similar if their feature vectors are being similar too. Furthermore, in our extensive evaluation, we showed that our system, blanket execution, or its implementation, blacks, actually outperform static systems, especially in situations where we have large syntactic differences. And furthermore, given Blacks as a building block, uh, we built a search engine, a binary search engine, that allow an analysts to easily answer questions like the one that we posed in the very beginning. Have I seen a function that is similar to the one I'm looking at already in the past? With that, I conclude my talk and am open for questions. Thank you.
interesting talk, uh, Jeremy Epstein, National Science Foundation. Um, would any of this apply in how to uh, languages that are not um, C, C++? Uh, are there, would there be optimizations that you might reasonably compare two different versions of Java and how would you, uh, compiled versions, and how would you differentiate them and what would, what would you use? So, especially in the, in, the, in the concept of Java, to the best of my knowledge, the Java compilers themselves have largely abandoned optimizations in favor of doing optimization at runtime through the, uh, the just-in-time compiler. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there is nothing in our technique, in the technique of blanket execution itself, that restricts its use to, to binary components. As long as you can fingerprint functions, and that is a prerequisite, so we're not dealing with at least in our setting, we're not dealing with uh, manually crafted assembly code that doesn't adhere to, to the function abstraction. As long as you can identify blocks of code that you want to compare to each other, and you can uh, identify and extract the feature vectors, you can follow through with the same technique and uh, pro potentially get similar results. Thank you. Hi, Zachy Reinman from Cisco and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, have you considered to run your tool on uh, obfuscated code or even use it as a tester for uh, obfuscation tools? So we have not run our tool on obfuscated code and the reason is that, uh, as mentioned in the paper, as a prerequisite we need to be able to identify functions. So again, we want to identify uh, blocks of code, coherent blocks of code, which are commonly functions against other functions. Now if I'm just given an obfuscated or a packed binary, uh, it's a challenge in itself already to identify where the functions are or how the binary looks once it's unpacked. So basically for a system like this to operate on obfuscated code, we would rely on tools uh, like Renovo that perform the, the unpacking step in the beginning and then basically take a snapshot from there and operate from there. So we did not try our system uh, on obfuscated code or packed code for that Thanks. matter. Christian Russell, Salant University. Uh, two questions for you. Um, one regards the concrete inputs that the functions take. So you need inputs for the functions and also you have this dummy page mm -hmm. of memory. Uh, what values did you use there for the ex execution? So si since we need to generate a multitude of uh, different environments and the idea basically comes from polynomial identity testing for circuits, uh, we want to generate uh, as many as possible or viable uh, different environments. We uh, generate the environments at random with certain restrictions. So for example, we're not assigning uh, register values that are above the kernel level boundary in the operating system. So in a 32-bit system, for example, you wouldn't assign uh, ad or values that are above the two gigabyte range because uh, even trying to map a page there from user space is not gonna succeed. And so we basically generate the environments at random, but again, we need to preserve the environment and be able to reproduce it because we want the same environment for all the individual BE runs. Mm -hmm. So if you have concrete integer values, for example, and you have like something like if x equals 1,200, mm -hmm. um, do you have something to stimulate exactly this um, expression? No, we do not perform any in-depth analysis of the code or how the individual values are being used to feed that back into the environment. Mm -hmm. However, I would agree that this is a very fruitful and interesting avenue to pursue further research on, um, also playing into how to increase coverage in, in test case generation. Absolutely, yes. Okay. The, the second question regards your granularity. So right now you can do some function, function waste matching, which is already cool, but sometimes you really want to be more fine granular, right? So some matching on the basic block level. For example, if you have a patch, mm -hmm. it's really interesting if the function is patched or not, so y you cannot really tell this on a functional level. It's much more focused on a basic block. Um, are you working on something to make it more fine granular system in the future? Something you, you're so for, for matching individual function blocks, there is actually uh, uh, quite some interesting previous work out there um, that uses uh, symbolic execution to actually prove the equivalence of two different basic blocks. Uh, yeah, so currently I'm not working towards that direction because the work that is there for individual basic blocks is already quite convincing. Okay, thanks. Uh, Adam Drew from uh, Qualcomm. Can you comment on um, some of the things that caused false positives and false negatives where um, the functions didn't match. I mean, it was it's sort of the same function, but, but for some reason um, your technique uh, didn't, didn't bear fruit. Um, so let me see. For 
so one interesting point that, that we that we identified that's also mentioned in the paper is that uh, sometimes you're not even looking at false positives or false negatives in the sense uh, of identifying similar functions, but sometimes it's just weird what the compiler produces. For example, if you're looking, I believe, at the du utility, there is six uh, implementations of the same function there that is ident or, and all the six implementations are identical to each other. And so even, even there, you, you might argue that this is making our, our case easier because if we just were randomly to guess the corresponding function, we would have a, a larger uh, uh, probability of hitting the right function there because there is six uh, different implementation of the exact same function. But even looking at things like that uh, is, is very interesting indeed. Um, to come up with, uh, uh, with an answer for your, uh, for your false negatives, especially if you, uh, let's see whether I can find this slide quickly. So this is the, the string compare name function uh, from, from LS, from the LS utility. If you use the dash R flag in addition to that, it will actually reverse the or search order. And uh, the function that will then be used to do the comparison is the string compare name underscore ref for reverse. And the entire code is, at least the entire source code, is exactly the same with the only difference that in line two, the arguments A and B are swapped. So you end up with a reverse decreasing order. And the challenge there was basically to come up with environments that expose those differences, right? Because you want to have uh, different values for A and B. And so uh, at the beginning where we only started our analysis with one as individual environment, you couldn't tell those two apart because you only have the values there. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so and with this, I would like to conclude the session. Let's thank Manuel again.